This is our homemade hovercraft. We built it when I was in first grade. By then, I'd wanted to build the hovercraft for some time already. So when we had to do a science project for school, I decided that mine definitely had to be a hovercraft. I enlisted my dad to consult in the engineering process and to help me with the power tools that my parents wouldn't allow me to use alone, like a jigsaw or a drill press. Later in this video, I'll show you how the hovercraft is built and what science experiments you can use it for. But first, let's see what you'll probably look like riding it. If you decide to build one for yourself, that is. Don't judge the clothing. We took the pictures on pajama day five years ago, when the hovercraft was two years old. On the pictures, there's always just one kid riding on the hovercraft, but it actually works with as many riders as you can fit on it. We tested ours with a load of more than 220 kilos, that's close to 500 pounds. At this point, it still hovered fine, but we ran out of space for additional people. This is how a hovercraft works. All hovercrafts have a motor that sucks in air and pushes it into a skirt. The skirt has holes that allows the air to escape into the space between the platform and the ground. Now air is lazy and doesn't like to be pressured, so it finds a way to escape. Well, when it escapes, it creates a small air gap, allowing the hovercraft to float above the ground virtually frictionless. You want the skirt to be somewhat flexible so that it can conform to a not perfectly even ground surface and to an uneven load distribution on the platform. We decided to build an inflatable skirt out of tarp. Our hovercraft uses a motor from a corded electric leaf blower. You can also use a gas powered leaf blower or a battery powered electric one. We decided to use a corded blower because it has more power than most battery powered ones and the runtime isn't limited by the battery capacity. Most battery powered leaf blowers can run on the highest setting for only a couple of minutes and you would probably need more than one of those blowers to get enough airflow for the hovercraft. The gas powered blower was no option for us because we wanted to use the hovercraft indoors as well as outdoors. Combustion engines also have many parts that get very hot. That would have been okay for us to deal with but we planned also to give rides to friends and classmates. A corded electric leaf blower is also the cheapest one of the three options, and we already had that one, so it was an easy choice. The only downside of a corded electric leaf blower is, well, the cord, but that's not really a problem because most of the time the hovercraft is being pulled with a paracord, so you can attach an extension cable to the paracord that you use to pull the hovercraft. So for a DIY hovercraft like ours, pulling it with a paracord is the only practical option. And as you can see, it's crazy fun. Because the hovercraft glides with very little resistance, it only needs a short pull on the rope. But the stronger the pull is, the bigger the fun. So you should try to enlist the biggest, strongest person available. Maybe you can lure him or her with ice cream. That worked with our dad. He pulled all of our classmates and the teachers across the gym hall and was rewarded with one bucket of haagen and two days of muscle ache. That was a pretty good deal for us. So we did it for three years in a row. Let's see how to build this hovercraft. We decided to make the hovercraft circular. The diameter of the platform is about 120 centimeters. That's because 120 by 240 centimeters or 4 feet by 8 feet is a common size for plywood and 120 centimeters is a practical size for the hovercraft. We decided to cut the ring for the skirt and the round platform out of one of those plywood sheets. Here I am drawing the circles onto the sheet. When the wood is cut, you have to sand the edges to prevent splinters. That takes time and is pretty boring, but necessary. When we were done sanding, my dad helped me with a drill press to drill the holes for the T-nets that we used to mount the platform to the skirt ring. I set the T-nets in by hand and hammered them flush with the heavy 1000 gram hammer. Then I had to mark the cutout for the outlet tube of the blower motor. We made the large hole by drilling a circle of smaller holes at its perimeter. Then we filed the hole to the correct size and flared the air outlet into the skirt to make it easier for the air to fill the skirt upon the startup of the hovercraft. My mom was concerned that we would run the hovercraft into the walls. That was a totally unjustified preconception. Just because we had formerly done that with pedal cars, tricycles, running bikes, skateboards, bikes, and a few other vehicles. But for her peace of mind, we came up with the idea of applying a self-accusive pipe insulation around the perimeter of the skirt ring. 
We wanted it to act as a bumper and it actually works great. Then it was time to mark and cut out the tarp for the skirt and staple it to the wooden skirt ring. The pipe insulation sits under the tarp. The black strips are duct tape that we use to additionally secure the pipe insulation to the skirt ring. We use gray weather strip tape to prevent air from escaping between the skirt ring and the platform. The platform is mounted to the skirt ring with a circle of screws with large flat socket heads. They bolt into the T-nuts in the skirt ring. One of these screws is longer so that you can attach the paracord to it. Then it was time for the first test ride. A hovercraft worked great, so we covered the platform with red neoprene to make it more comfortable to sit on. We also painted the underside of the hovercraft and added some handles made from chin straps of an old bicycle helmet to make it easier to transport. We used spray glue to attach the neoprene. That worked okay, but after the hovercraft had run for a few minutes, the neoprene slowly lifted from the platform and created a huge bubble. We realized that the pressurized air was slowly seeping through the plywood platform and got trapped under the airtight neoprene cover. It was only a very tiny fraction of the volume of air that the motor blows under the platform, so it doesn't influence the performance of the hovercraft. But the neoprene bubble was a problem. We solved it by piercing the neoprene with small, normal household needles. It took a lot of tiny, absolutely invisible holes, but it worked perfectly. Let's have a closer look at the motor. Our blower motor is from a shop vac leaf blower combination that we had in our garage. I wanted to get as much airflow and lift out of it as possible. I already knew that the edges and sharp bends create turbulence and thereby slow the flowing air down. So I wanted to see if I could improve the performance of the blower by modifying the air intake. It was also one of the research points of my science project. I didn't need an absolute value for the volume or speed of the airflow, but a measurement that would allow me to compare the performance of different setups. The easiest solution was to let the motor blow onto the surface of a digital scale. The higher the number, the larger the product of air volume and speed. I started with the standard setup of the blower motor, with its original air intake, blowing onto the scale from a distance of around 30 centimeters. It created about 760 to 775 grams of force, or about 7.5 newtons. That was the base number from where I would try to improve the performance. I tested 11 setups altogether in different combinations, with long or with short intake tubes, with or without a cap or with or without an intake funnel that I had made from insulation foam. The most efficient setup was this one. It produced 985 gram force or 30% more than the standard setup, but it was far too dangerous. The sharp edged metal piece that you can see a few centimeters behind the open funnel is the blower's impeller. It rotates at several thousand RPM and can cut off fingers and suck in long hair. So I had to use the best safe solution that wouldn't shred my classmates. And here it is. It combines the tube and the cap from the muffler that is normally meant to be used on the exhaust side of the motor when it is used in the shop vac. I removed the foam insert, installed the insulation foam funnel to smooth the sharp edges and used a nylon sock to make absolutely sure that not even the longest hair can reach the impeller. With this intake setup, the blower motor pushed 950 gram force. It was still a full 25% more than the original setup and just 5% less than the strongest but unsafe intake. Here's a table of the test results. If you want to take a closer look, just use the pause button. This is how we modified the shop vac motor for hovercraft duty. You can adapt the principle to your own blower. Once all screws are removed, the enclosure halves can be separated. I'm rerouting the power cord, and that way when the motor is mounted, the power cord will exit at the bottom, closer to the paracord which we use to pull the hovercraft. The black part that I have just removed is the exhaust muffler. We'll use it later. Now I am installing the motor mount that attaches the blower motor to the hovercraft platform. We've built the mount out of a simple bent piece of flat steel. It mounts with two cabinet screws to the motor enclosure and with two more to the platform. You have to make absolutely sure that you know exactly what you're doing and that the mount is electrically and mechanically safe. When the motor mount is installed, the enclosure can be closed again. Now I'm removing the intake assembly from the motor. When the motor does vacuum duty, it sits behind a large vacuum filter. 
Let's turn the exhaust muffler into a performance booster for the intake. It has a noise reducer element made from open cell foam that is removed and replaced with the blue intake funnel. I'm using 8 sheet metal screws to install an adaptive sleeve that I have made from a rubber adapter for shop vacs. The motor is now ready for the hovercraft. The adapter that connects the outlet to the platform is a large standard rubber flange that is normally used for plumbing. The hovercraft's handlebar is from Gia's first bike, Green Mamba. We mounted it to the hovercraft with a modified BMX bike stem. I've also installed the manometer on the hovercraft. It measures the pressure differentials between its two ports. There are two thin pressure hoses on our hovercraft. One is connected to the inside of the inflatable skirt and one is, to con is connected to the area under the platform. With this setup, we can measure the overpressure under the platform compared to the, its surrounding air. It's that overpressure that actually does the work of lifting the platform. You can also measure the overpressure in the skirt compared to the outside pressure and the pressure difference between the skirt and the space under the platform. When the manometer is mounted, the hovercraft can be actually used as a scale. We did a series of tests and found that the pressure under the platform rises proportionally to the weight of the platform and its load. That makes perfect sense because whatever the weight on the platform, the air pressure under it has to lift the platform high enough to escape below the skirt. And if the weight is twice as heavy, the air has to push twice as hard to lift it. You can actually estimate how high the pressure will be by measuring the weight of the hovercraft and its load on the platform, and dividing that number by the surface area under the platform. With G and me on it, the hovercraft weighs 100 kilograms. It has an effective surface diameter of 120 centimeters. A circle with a diameter of 120 centimeters has a surface area of about 11,310 square centimeters. So in our case, one square centimeter would have to lift about 8.8 .8 grams. A pressure of 8.8 .8 grams per square centimeter equals 8.8 .8 millibar. As you can see, when we finally arranged ourselves in the camera on the running hovercraft, the actual measurement was 8.7 millibars to 8.8 .8 millibar. So our calculation was spot on. Oh, and one more thing. Under no circumstances should you use this hovercraft in or close to water. Professional hovercrafts do work on water, but this hovercraft just doesn't have enough airflow to work on water. It will probably sink and get destroyed, but most importantly, if a water comes in contact with an electrical component connected to line voltage, it will cause a shock that can and probably will kill you. So just don't do it, and just have fun with your hovercraft. Thank you for joining us! Oh, and one more thing. Under no circumstances should you use this water. <laughs> oh, and one more thing. Under no circumstances should you use this water. This water <laughs> on a hovercraft. Oh, and one more thing. Under no circumstances can you use this hovercraft near or close to water. Same thing. <laughs>